So Faith, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go into the future, can you tell us a little bit more about your own background? Where did you grow up? Well, um, I grew up in a, in a rural area um, in Mpumalanga called Iluwatin. Um, I'm a rural girl. I say that I'm a rural girl who came to Joburg. And um, mine is a good story because Jimmy came to Josie and Josie treated her well. Um, so I, I come from a very rural area. I always joke about it and I say that people have had dogs. I had cows as a pet, you know, because that's right. exactly where, where I grew up. Um, my mom with my grandmother um, and my grandparents as well. Yeah. So it was a very good upbringing, um, very grounded. Um, but, you know, I, I still was raised. I was raised with a more global perspective and that I can take from my grandmother. My grandmother was very and is. She's still very global in her in her. Thinking. mannerism and in her right. thinking um, so she raised me in a very global way she used to make sure that if there was load shedding for example mm. which started a long time ago electricity shortage mm. in this country did start a long time ago she would roast marshmallows for me by the fireplace because she saw it done on television Okay. And um, so a lot of things she would do. What she would do, she'd pick up um, some some um, activities and some you know ways of life on television, and she'll implement mm. them on me in the hope of maybe developing me to be a very mm. global-minded um, person and to be an individual who's more customized and culturalized mm. in diverse forms of cultural practices. So, Faith, what was your dream career? as you grew up <laughs> growing up nothing um, no growing up i just you know it's so funny um i used to say to people growing up that i just want to hold a briefcase that was my definition of success when i was a little girl um so and unfortunately i'm not holding a briefcase mm. but i do have a handbag um but growing up it was more of a I just want to hold a briefcase. I think it's also with, in line with the entrepreneurial spirit. So I've always been entrepreneurial and enterprising. And um, I, I always viewed people that were enterprising and entrepreneurial as people who held briefcases. Mm -hmm. So I've always wanted to hold a briefcase because I think somewhere, somehow the entrepreneurial bug bit me um, a long time ago. It just took time for it to manifest in the way that it did. Um, and it's only when I just got exposed to school and when I got exposed to high school. I mean, I thought I wanted to be a marketer. First of all, I thought I wanted to go into marketing. And um, I remember my principal in high school saying to me, I don't think that's a very good idea for you. It's just, it does not seem like a very good idea. And then I ended up studying economics and international relations and political science, which we'll go into. Um, but yeah, I've always had a very diverse view. Um, always trying to find out what I wanted to do. Um, if not holding a briefcase, then I actually thought I was going to be a diplomat at also one stage of my okay. life while I was studying at VIT. So I've got a degree in international relations. Mm. So I thought, mm, maybe this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be a diplomat. I'm definitely sure of it. And then because I've got a, a degree in industrial psychology, I thought, mm, I'm going to be a diplomat with an industrial psychology uh, background. Right. Um, but lo and behold, media found me and um, um, a lot of my life changed and transpired from there on. So Faith, who inspired you in your early days? Who inspired me in my early days? I, you know... <sighs> I would honestly say that from what I used to view on television and what mm -hmm. television's view of success was, yeah. that's how I was inspired. And I'm just talking now before my teens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as I hit my teens and, and going into early, well, 18, 19, 20, I have to say it was Oprah. I know it sounds so corny, mm -hmm. but I have to say it was Oprah. Um, and simply because to see somebody who's your color, um, who was able to be bold um, and, mm -hmm. and transcend very across multi, multiple mediums, across multiple platforms, and make mm -hmm. a success of herself out of it. Um, it gives somebody um, introspection that if somebody of my color can mm -hmm. do it, irrespective of where that individual is in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, of course, America is a more developed country than South Africa would be, but there's a person of my color who's female, who is bold, who's taking risks, who's, who's um, not afraid to speak her mind. Surely then there is a space for me as a young black woman to do so mm. in the South African context so I've always been inspired by her um, I mean and then when I got a little bit older it was Angela Merkel believe it or not mm. um, <laughs> the Chancellor um, the German Chancellor and I think and I also think that the reason why is because I'm attracted to strong women mm. strong women across colors and creeds um, and as I grew up a little bit more, it was Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of mm. Facebook. So women that are strong, women that are innovative, women that are breaking barriers, women mm. that are um, doing what is, well, the unexpected, so to say. 
Um, I'm really inspired by them. And I know that the women that I've mentioned are very global, um, but that's exactly it. I, I have to look at myself as a local person, mm. but I have to think global in terms of my, my perspective and also in terms of where I want to grow in my career, in my, in my purpose, in my life. So looking back over your career, uh, would you say there was a major turning point mm. or number of turning points? I think looking back over my career, I would say that there have been a number of turning points. Um, I mean, I was working since I was 16, so mm. I have been working since I was 16. And I think that also the structure of my family life played a vital role in the woman mm. that I became and in the ambitions that I that I acquired as I grew up. Um, so I come from a poor household. So after my, my being raised by my grandmother and my mom, my mother remarried. And um, I was raised with by, by my mom and then my stepfather, who, well, he raised me um, mm. in Johannesburg. So we moved from Bumalanga to Johannesburg to start a life. But growing up also had its ups and downs. And at one stage, we found ourselves poor. In fact, so poor that we had to stand in queues um, at the church to mm. get food parcels every Wednesday and Sunday mm. because we didn't have money. My Both of my parents were unemployed at the time. And I'm the firstborn of four children. So both parents are uh, unemployed, four kids to feed and um, the best option for us then was to stand in a queue um, and receive food parcels mm. from food aid groups you know and that was my reality for some time it humbled me it built resilience within me but mm. also I think it was a big turning point in the sense of wanting more for myself I knew that this is not this is not the best that I can mm. have you know standing in a queue and I don't and that's why I I, I empathize with anybody in a less fortunate position and I, empath and I empathize with somebody who's disadvantaged or comes from a disadvantaged background because I know what that feels like. I know mm. what it's like to, to feel ashamed at one stage and to feel mm. as though you are overwhelmed by the circumstances. And that's what I felt like for a significant portion of my life. But I think it also shaped me in the sense of wanting more, wanting and aspiring to be more, to do mm. more, to... To, to stretch across the actual current circumstance. So that was one turning point in my life. Um, the next one, I was working on a radio show at YFM um, with um, a, a guy called DJ Smooth, Mrs. Zuliope, and he said to me, I think I was 21 at the time, he looked at me and he said to me, Faith, why don't you have a business? Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a strange question to ask a 21-year-old who's still trying to find themselves. Mm -hmm. Why don't you have a business? And, and he said, no, every person must have a business. You must have a business. You must be entre entrepreneurial. You must mm -hmm. be enterprising. And I thought, <coughs> okay. Let me have a business. And that's where I first started my recruitment business. I mean, it started and then it failed. But I respect mm. failure and I expect it. When we can fail in business, I think that it affords us the opportunity to learn fast. Mm. Um, a lot of us are afraid of failure in business, but we don't understand that failure actually helps us and equips us mm. to, to learn fast and to grow and to develop um, as enterprising individuals. So that was another turning point of my life. And I think the third one, significantly, was when um, I went to study in um, the States through the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program mm. um, in 2014. That was a significant turning point in my life because it, it, it exposed me to different ways of life. It exposed me to different cultural norms. Um, but most importantly, um, I was the one who was the only, the only person in 2014 to have the White House call them and the head of security call them from the mm. White House um, to personally ask her to introduce Barack Obama at the time was our president. And um, not only that, to write a speech for him, which I did and I deliberated right. and, I, and I gave it um, and, I, and I recited the speech in town hall just before I introduced him. I got to spend some time with him as well, just before we even had the town hall. So uh, moments like that, these mm. significant moments of life shape you and form you. Um, one more though, um, was in 2013, the year prior to that, oh. Um, where I was given an opportunity as somebody who I, I was viewed as, you know, it was the South African Jewish Board of Direct Deputies. They, mm. they viewed me as, um, as somebody who's influential in the media space, especially as a young black vo mm. voice. And um, they afforded me the opportunity to go to Israel and Palestine. So 2013, I found myself in Israel and Palestine, mm. understanding politics, understanding the, the way of the media there, understanding what shapes and forms global politics and the external forces. So I'm able to speak with conviction on Palestinian politics as, well, mm. as much as I am able to speak on um, Israeli politics because mm. I've been in those places, you know, and I think those are moments in my life where I say, you know what, they inspired me to do more. I, I looked mm. at myself during those moments of my life and I thought, I cannot be exposed to so much at a very young age because mm. I was young, I was in my early 20s. I cannot be exposed to so much at a young age and not do anything about it or it be for nothing else other than my absolute gratification. Mm -hmm. You don't get exposed to, you know, those positions of power 
and you don't get to meet individuals of, of positions of influence and significance if all you are to do with it is to to be mm. you know completely self-absorbed by it mm. there has to be a greater meaning and there has to be a greater purpose to it mm. at least i believe so and um, those are moments that shaped me so faith what is the future holding for you the future well mm. i want i've got two options in life uh, and i say this with absolute respect i've got two options and, and mm. i don't stop until i've got it I'm either A, going to be Africa's most powerful and influential woman, or B, um, the, the first female president of South Africa. I have no other, mm. I have no other, I have no other ambition. Mm. If you have to ask me, Faith, or do you have any other ambition? Absolutely not. Mm. As, apart from those two, either being Africa's most powerful and influential woman, um, or South Africa's first female president, I don't have any other ambitions. Um, and I do work towards that goal, whichever way life takes me um, in between mm. those two goals. Um, and, and that's what the future holds for me. And I'm deliberate about that um, in the sense of understanding that now and everything that I do, my purpose, running the school, it's not just about me. Mm. It's about the legacy that I will leave and it's about generations that will be changed as a result of what I'm doing, um, as a result of even having a Faith Mangope and a Technology and Leadership Institute. It's the education that will come out of it. It's the lives that will be changed. It's the innovation that will come out of it. It will be knowing that I contributed to new Elon Musks being formed mm. in this world. Women who are Elon Musk, who take on the roles of Elon Musk. New Sheryl Sandbergs that are formed mm. who, who, who are you know um, uh, uh, playing around and, and who, who actually experiment with technology and innovation and, and mm. growth and development. And to know that I contributed significantly to the building and the development of the African continent um, and future-proofing the world of work so mm. that indeed people in the future can be active contributors to the economy because we don't speak about that space mm. also, the world of work and what the world of mm. work looks like in the future. So to know that I can contribute significantly and positively with the, to that future, that's what I think, um, that's when I know that I would have left a legacy, um, not just for myself, but for, for generations to come and change the entire status quo and the narrative of the African continent. So as president of South Africa, <laughs> what would you do in your first 100 days? What would, what would be your agenda? You know what I'm saying? Agenda number one, top of mind. The first agenda will be a complete zero in and focus on education. Mm. I think we underestimate the value of education. And I'm not just talking about education from a from a you know menial perspective or education from just a lateral perspective. I'm talking about education where we start looking at ourselves as globally competitive and we ask ourselves our questions, what is going to cause us? What policies do we have to put in place? Mm. What measurements do we have to put in place? What kind of educators do we have to put in place? So indeed we are globally aligned when it mm. comes to this the level of education that we teach right the problem is what we've done is we've given what good is an education certificate is a is a school leaving certificate if you cannot do anything with it there are too many unemployed educated people out there mm. or unemployed people with degrees or unemployed people with diplomas so how do we make ourselves globally competitive so that I am relevant in South Africa as I am relevant in Nigeria as I am relevant in mm. Denmark as I am relevant in Holland all of this must must play a role to some extent and I think that what we've done is that we've said that we are a global uh, 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 you know we're a global world and we've, we've, we've stressed this notion of globalization but what we haven't done is actually implement the measures that actually make us a global community so education separates us because there are those individuals who are studying um, in the West for example where their education level is quite high significantly and therefore they're able to be significant contributors in fact what we do as Africa we we hire the skills of those people and we bring them into the country mm. and then we call it um, capital investment. But what would happen if we start investing in our people, human capital? Mm. If we need to start investing in human capital, human capital, I truly believe and I live by this mantra, human capital is the next raw natural resource. The natural resource that we need to start focusing on is human capital. Because if we're going to be start continuing to focus on mineral resources, the fact of the matter is minerals are going to run out. Mm. It's what happened to many countries. Why can't we take South Korea, for example, as an example? Why mm. can't we take what's happening in China? They've had to completely diversify the economies simply because they didn't have enough capacity mm. um, to skill the people and to actually help their people to be economic contributors. So they had to diversify. So China, for example, is more consumer-based. South Korea focused mm. more on their human capital. What would happen if we started investing more on our human capital? Because in that sense, we can export our human capital mm. because it's a natural resource. In that 
sense, we can become comp competitive on global markets because it's our natural resource. So my first 100 days will be focusing and completely doing an overhaul on the education system, making sure that it aligns, taking it from the from ECD, early childhood development, mm -hmm. right up until somebody finishes their A-levels or O-levels, which, by mm -hmm. the way, I will be introducing as well, um, right up until mm -hmm. university as well. When they finish university, I want someone to be studying in South Africa and have the same or equivalent um, mm -hmm. qualification and capacity and resourcing as someone who's studying in Harvard. Why can't it be like that? Why is it that I have to take someone from Harvard and I view them as more educationally elite mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody that is studying in South Africa? Mm -hmm. We have to be on the level. We have to level the playing fields where education is concerned. That's the first thing. The second thing, we have to focus significantly on, on, on honing in on our security in our country. Mm. I, I, you cannot live in a place and feel unsafe all the time mm. because we're raising children, we're raising families. Families come from this country, children come from this country. I want children to be able to play in the park and not think that there's a predator down the road who's mm. watching them, right? So safety, security, crime prevention, these are all measures that need to need a complete overhaul. We need to make a sex offenders list public so that yeah. everybody knows that this person is an offender, that this this person feels uncomfortable even being in that kind mm. of neighborhood. We cannot be um, apologetic about putting together stringent measures to protect mm. our people and to protect our borders and to protect our our South African citizens and Africans seeking any form of economic opportunity mm. in the country. Because foreign nationals also contribute facts and, and stats have proven. A lot of people that immigrate from other countries and come into a different country, they contribute significantly in that country mm. simply because they become more enterprising, mm. right? So, but then we need to protect those people who are coming in for economic reasons. So these are all different measures. So I think, I think I've already got my, my first speech done when it comes to that. I think you can see I've got a plan. <laughs> I can see that uh, most definitely. So Faith, tell us, what does the future of leadership mean to you? Sure. I think the future of leadership is understanding what's going to be required of leaders in the future. Mm. Right? And I think that we don't necessarily, um, and I'm, I'm going I'm to break it down into various spaces because we don't understand, sometimes many of us don't understand what is required of leadership mm. in the future. So let's take it from a corporate perspective. The fact of the matter is, we're well, Africa is slowly catching up to it, but significantly in Western countries, you don't have to be at the office nine to five, Monday to Friday, and clock in so that somebody can know and see that you're at work. Mm -hmm. People show up to the office once a week and then they work from home. If I'm a leader of that kind of organizational team, my leadership style needs to be so agile and deliverable based, right? So mm -hmm. these are the deliverables that you have to align yourself with and have to put forward by the end of the week. So everything has to change from a corporate perspective. So you are more deliverables focused, right? So what have you been, what's your output? You're more output focused. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in a hotel and you're working on your laptop, but are you going to give me my deliverables come the end of the week? Because that's the tool, that's a yardstick of mm -hmm. measurement. Because now I can't measure you by the fact that you're sitting in front of your desk in an office. And that's the future of leadership, especially from an organizational construct, right? How do we manage teams? And also from an organizational perspective, Teams are going to be coming in from different countries. So you need to be able to um, be so multidisciplined and also be so diverse in your approach that you know how to speak to somebody who's, who's in your team but is in India. And somebody who's in your team but is in Singapore. Someone who's in your team and is, an, is in Angola. Somebody who's a member of, of your team and is in uh, you know, Central African Republic. Whatever it is, right? You need to be able to be so diverse and agile in your leadership style that you're able to speak to those different people and understand the cultural nuances that come with it, right? So I'm not going to be able to... And you need to be also be able to understand that what's, what's true for one culture is not true for the other culture, mm -hmm. right? So some, maybe let's say that in Japan, it's a very big focus on excellence and a very big focus on hierarchy. I need to be able to operate mm -hmm. as a manager or as a leader so mm -hmm. that I'm able to speak to that. So in other words, be so understanding, empathetic to my team leader that I understand that, okay, your excellence is, your level of excellence is what drives you, which means that you probably might be a little bit more pedantic than maybe, mm -hmm. say, somebody from a different country. And I need to be able to understand that cultural nuance as much as a, an African nuance where 
in fact it's true of the african continent that they say that lunch for example or or meetings in the african continent take hours instead of just mm. 30 minutes right but i need to be culturally sensitive to that mm. so it's going to require leaders who are number one <coughs> culturally sensitive number two mm. diverse in their thinking mm. number three agile because the the whole purpose of agility is so that mm. you're able to adapt to yourself with the, whatever environment that comes your way but unfortunately many of us become so rigid mm. in our thinking and we become so rigid um in our in our framework of operation that we actually end up excluding people instead of mm. formulating inclusive organizational mm. culture and organizational culture needs to be inclusive so mm. those are the types of leaders that i believe are going to be truly effective in the future and by the way the future that is not so distant because mm. more and more organizations are taking the approach of having a more multifaceted a multicultural um even multinational team right mm. so if you're a leader of that team and it's all multinational multicultural how then are you able to adapt so that everybody is able to contribute to the team and not feel as though they're being excluded which means that you have to do away with racism and your racial stereotypes which means you have to do away with your prejudice which means you have to do away with your closed mindedness which means you have to do away with a lot of um one may say that a hard hard wiring we must do away with a lot of the hard wiring that we've been raised up with if we're truly going to be effective leaders of the future that's just from an organizational culture perspective but from a national perspective let's say that what type of leaders are we looking at number 1 leaders who are not afraid to be human what we forget is that we're leading human beings you cannot lead a human being if you're afraid of being human yourself mm -hmm. that's how many of the great leaders even come into positions of power because they become relatable to the people mm -hmm. leaders who are truly relatable are the leaders that are going to be more effective but also on the other side of it especially from the african context our leaders who are not afraid to step out of power when the time is up Mm. You cannot be leading one country for mm. 30 years and think that you're going to be effective. Mm. There is nothing effective about your leadership mm. if you're still running a country 30 years on and all you have is your experience from taking the country from colonial rule mm. into no, I'm not even going to say it's dem mm. democracy. It's not democracy if you've been running a country mm. for 30 years and you insist on being the leader mm. for 30 years. That's not a democratic dispensation. You might as well be called a monarchy or a dictatorship. Mm. A dictatorship. Mm. That's a dictatorship. It's not a it's not a mm. democracy and I think um especially for african leaders do not be afraid to step out of power if your time is up mm. i truly believe that you should not be in power for more than two terms you shouldn't mm. as a leader you shouldn't be in power for more than two terms because number one you need to give the cycle of life the next opportunity to go into the next growth level mm. you're still operating in one growth level you've got 10 or 12 or 16 years or or well 8 years we've got 8 mm. years to make a difference or 10 years if you con considering the amount of times that you actually go to the elections between 8 and 10 years or you get to make a difference after that quit quit while your legacy is still strong mm. and i think that it it's 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 a travesty i truly believe it's a travesty to know that there are african leaders who choose to be in power for more than 30 years mm. because what ends up happening is that their legacy is 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 thwarted their legacy is destroyed by the very same individuals themselves mm. and i think that's a significant downfall um of many african leaders um but also um understanding the fact that as a as a leader on the african continent you need to be able to have your priorities straight and be free of corruption in other words be so true in yourself and be free of corruption we cannot have states where people where presidents are looting the very same state they're supposed to be governing why Why do we have states where people presidents are looting? That does mm. not make sense to me. That that in fact says something about our inability to have foresight and our inability to have vision because if you truly had vision, you wouldn't be stealing away from the vision that you're trying to create. So, I don't understand why leaders want to want to loot the very same country that they're supposed to be governing. You shouldn't mm. be in power for long. You shouldn't be looting. But at the same time, you also should be prioritizing human beings, human capital. I tell you this, human capital is the next mineral resource mm. right it's going to replace mineral resources the mm. next natural resource is human capital and when we start focusing on our human capital we start applying diversified economies right and economies that are able to sustain themselves for more than just 100 years because we're always consistently agile and innovative and moving mm. the fourth industrial revolution is here the african many african states are even struggling with even the concept mm. of a fourth industrial revolution because to them it's scary but if we were agile enough if we were innovative enough mm. we wouldn't be so scared of the next and of the future mm. in fact we'd be embracing them and be active to our participants within the fourth industrial revolution now faith 
What have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for building future leaders? My own journey, sure. I consider myself a, a, a young leader. Um, so I think what, what, you know what I've learned, to be very honest with you, there is something about hardship. Mm. There is something about, there's something about having tough times. And I, and I, and I, and I say this, not taking away to what the repercussions may be for many people, mm. but I'm built by my struggle. Mm. My trials have built me into the resilient, into the focused woman that I am today. Mm. My past has built me into the focused woman that I am today. Um, I understand the value of hard work. I understand the value of ethical leadership. I understand the value of um, being able to exert yourself and to have passion for what you do. Even the way I'm speaking to you is with passion because I truly believe it comes from a place of conviction. Mm. I believe in everything that I'm saying. It's not because I read it in a text book is because I try my best to live by the various, um, uh, 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 not even theories, but the various, uh, you know, structures and, and, and life, life mantras that, that I'm even speaking about. Um, I, I, I try to live by those mm. every single day. And there is something about going through trial and tribulation mm. that forms and builds a person. Mm. There is something about it. It builds resilience. If you want a community that is resilient, if, if you want a community that knows how to be innovative, there is something about Do you know that a lot of the billionaires actually come from recessions? Mm. Countries had billionaires come out of recession. It took a recession mm. for certain billionaires to come out of it. Mm. Isn't it funny how the point of hardship actually mm. gives birth to billionaires? Mm absolute wealth and success mm. so it says something about mm. hardship it says mm. something about the resilience and the innovation and the creativity that comes from a, pra a place of trial mm. now do i want to stay in that place of trial absolutely not i i have got fake eyelashes on i'm not trying to be in the struggle mm. but i don't take away the the, the value that any tribulation or trial actually gives you or mm. challenge. So my challenge might be completely different to your challenge. What I am saying is that a lot of times we are afraid of hardships as human beings, mm. right? We don't want to experience the hard times in life because mm. we've taught ourselves how to be unconscious or so or operate in mm. our yeah maybe unconscious in our unconscious level where we want everything to be smooth sailing and we don't like rocking the boat but there is something beautiful about having your boat rocked because mm. it forces you to become a creative individual it forces you to step into your next area of greatness what would happen if people were not afraid of challenge if people were not afraid of trial if people were not afraid of problems that they saw a problem as an opportunity for a solution Mm. What would happen if people started rethinking and rewiring themselves where problems are not problems, but problems are opportunities for solutions? Then we become a more solutions-based community as mm. opposed to a community where at any slight sense or, or slight uh, a sense of tribulation or trial, we go up in arms, we go in, in protest, we have campaigns. What would happen if we just as a resilient community were creative in the way in which we overcame problems and obstacles in our lives and I think that for me is it's, it's what helped me become the person that I am and I'm hoping that it will help me become the person in the future mm -hmm. someone who's not afraid of challenges someone who's brave enough um, to stand in the face of adversity and and be resolute in it and overcome it because when we true success I believe has true success has got its actual strong point in the ability to overcome challenges mm. when you are able to overcome one challenge and move on to the next level and overcome the next challenge and move on to the mm. next level and move on, overcome the next challenge there is something growth oriented about that there is something so beautiful about that but that's true success when you know that nothing can get you down but every time there's a challenge you overcome this, that's the beauty of human. That says something about the human spirit and your ability to be resilient. Mm. So, Faith, when you speak to aspiring le leaders, what is it you tell them? How should they navigate social media? <laughs> and how should they communicate on social media <clears throat> to build their own personal brands? I think, you know, they always say, and I've and I, and I read statistics on social media, and they actually say that social media is for social purposes, right? Mm. So, pay in mind. First of all, social media is for social purposes. If you do not want something to come back to you on a social platform, 
don't post it. And also understand, and this is what I actually experienced just this past Sunday, someone is always watching. We don't, we take that for granted. Someone is always watching watching they may not be making a comment they may not be liking your posts they may not even be uh, what do they do it they may not be commenting commenting on your posts mm. they may not be doing any of the sort but they are watching mm. someone is always watching and if we took that into cognizance we would be more not careful but i think would be more tactful mm. and more uh, deliberate and more mm. intentional in what we're posting mm -hmm. you see when you know that someone is always watching you become intentional because you ask yourself what do i want them to see mm -hmm. right and 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 when you take into conscious the fact that this 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 and the people that are watching are not even people from your country by mm -hmm. the way the beauty of social media is that it's made the world smaller so it might not even be someone from south africa that is watching it may be someone from Atlanta, Georgia that is watching, but someone is always watching. And what do you want them to see? And that's the question. And I think that a lot of times we become very frivolous with social media because in our minds, mm -hmm. the people that are watching are my friends and no mm -hmm. more, right? Yeah. So we become very limited. But mm -hmm. if we understood that the whole premise of social media is to link up and to make a global community smaller, mm -hmm. then we'd understand that actually someone is watching me who may not even be from this country, who may actually be my next boss or maybe my next business partner, mm -hmm. or maybe my next associate, or maybe my next husband, or maybe mm -hmm. my next wife, whatever it is. But what do I want that person to see? And what I'm posting on social media, is that person going to be, you know, going to feel confident in the person that I am, mm -hmm. or going to look at me and go, you know what, this person is a bit sketchy. So I think that mm -hmm. we need to take into account um, the intentionality about social media. And I think more leaders need to be intentional with what they post. Be intentional. Even if you're showing your human side, be intentionally human, right? Even if you're posting something, be intentional about it. I mean, I'm going to use a typical example. Um, about a few years ago, I had a magazine asked to, so I was on a cover of a magazine, and a magazine said to me, Faith, would like to do a, a cover shoot, but have you in a bathing suit on a swimming pool? Mm. And I thought to myself, hold on. One day I'm going to want to fulfill some position of leadership. Mm. Is that what I want you to know? and see me as before mm. it and not that i'm taking away from the confidence of my body i'm absolutely very confident in the way that i look mm. but is that what i want you to remember me for no mm. that's not so i choose and i chose not to do it that way because i understand that actually somewhere somehow in the future it might be 10 years from now it might be 20 years from now but when i step into a platform that is of a global significance <coughs> You know journalists, they're going to go back to the articles. They're going to do an entire rundown of your life. Mm. And is that what I want them to see? And if that's not what I want them to see, then why do I post it in the first place? Now, if you go onto my social media page, you'll also see that I have no problem with posting by the beach because mm. I'm with my family. I'm in the beach. I'm by mm. the beach. Yes, of course, because I'm human. As much as I'm a leader, I spend time with my family by the seaside. And no, I'm not going to wear long sleeves at the beach. But there's context to everything. And I think that what we're missing is understanding that there's context to everything. That some things need to be intentional and not just frivolous. And we shouldn't take social media as just a platform for being people who are irresponsible and frivolous. We can actually, this could be an opportunity for, for running campaigns. A lot of the campaigns, especially American campaigns, were run on social media. Yeah, of course. Social media is the number one tool of, yeah. of politics. Politics are not apart from social media, not excluded from social media. Mm -hmm. So does that not mean that we need to be more intentional about it mm -hmm. going forward? Faith, what would you say are the biggest challenges future leaders are likely to encounter in their career and mm -hmm. in their lives? Sure. Future leaders, I think, um, are likely to... Sure, I have to think about it for me now. Future leaders are, I think, their biggest problem would be the agility. Mm. and to get rid of their old framework of thinking and their, um, their old way of thinking. Because 
what I found is when you say future leaders, and oftentimes you're referring to somebody who's over the age of 45, who is maybe in, been in an organization for 20 years and who does things this way and has always worked for them and does not want to change. And what we're finding more and more in organizational culture is that these businesses are being run by millennials. Young people now are coming up and they're running businesses and they're starting projects and they're becoming, you know, thought leaders in it, you know. Um, if you take a Mark Zuckerberg, for example, who would have thought by then a 20-something-year-old kid would be the one that is running and, and, and is responsible for the livelihoods of hundreds of people? Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think, I think that even the way in which organizations are starting to look, they're starting to have a younger face. And, and, and I think that a lot of times for the older generation who are in those institutions and in those situations, theirs is to be agile and to learn how to be agile and not feel replaced. Mm. And I think that's the problem, is that a lot of times people view millennials as this threat that is going to come in and take over their jobs and declare them redundant. No, there is growth and there's development and there's learning in somebody who's older than you, who's got more experience than you, who's been there for a longer period of time than you have. And I don't take away the learnings from somebody who's over the age of 50 and has been in an organization for 20 years because you know something about that organization that I may not necessarily know yeah. as a young person that is coming into it. Um, <clears throat> So I think a lot of times that's where the future of leadership is going to be facing quite a significant challenge because we've got these young people that have got, they're more diverse and they're more open and they're more zealous and they've got this energy and they're fireballs that are coming up into institutions that currently have got people that are maybe much older who've been mm. there for a number of years <laughs> and they don't know how to coexist with one another. In fact, there's a lot of disrespect that starts there because one feels replaced by the other, whereas the other one feels like the other one is not listening to them because they, they feel they as though they're speaking to a child. So you've got a very parent-child relationship that is always going on in organizational culture where somebody who's 50 is looking at somebody who's 30 and thinking, hold on, you're old enough to be my kid and yet you're telling me what to do? How dare you? You know, And that's the, the, that's the cultural base. That's what's happening right now in organizations where you've got these younger breed, this young breed and this older breed that are coming together. Many of times they're clashing because one, they're afraid of being replaced by the other. And I think that for future leaders, that's where we need to seriously hone in mm -hmm. and understand that there is wisdom with age. Mm -hmm. Wisdom comes with age and experience. Mm -hmm. Innovation and um, zealousness and um, a go-getting spirit and openness and agility comes with youth. Mm -hmm. There is a beauty about it. It comes with youth. Mm -hmm. And the two need to exist if you're truly going to create successful organizations and sustainable organizations, mm -hmm. not where one wants to replace the other one. Even in politics, this becomes even true for politics. How many times have you heard political rhetoric about the need for younger blood within political organizations? It's a fact. Many political parties have been stressing and lamenting on this need for younger blood. But unfortunately, what ends up happening in many political parties is that they feel as though they're going to be replaced or their paychecks are going to be taken out, of the, out from them because of this younger breed. And they don't want to feel as though they're redundant. What are they going to do with, for the rest of their lives if they're not a politician? Mm -hmm. Right, and and this call for the younger blood and this call for more innovative, diverse young people needs to be met with an understanding that it does not declare you as an older person redundant. Mm -hmm. All it does it means that you are now in a position where you are the guide. Right, um, I think there's an organization that is called the Elders, mm -hmm. uh, which is a global organization of um, world leaders. Right, mm -hmm. and the reason why there was an Elders in the first place was because from the premise, it, it, it wanted to take on the role of when I'm done being a leader of my country, mm -hmm. I'm now able to look at things from a global perspective and contribute to various growths and, and developments across mm -hmm. continents and across various con uh, countries from a global perspective because I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, mm -hmm. I've been burnt a couple of times and baby I can show you how to do it so that you don't get your fingers burnt unfortunately the realistic perspective is that many of us come in with it from a place of fear and intimidation and so we don't know how to coexist with one another we don't know how to learn from one another because we're so afraid of being replaced by each other and that's a huge challenge I believe for organizations in the future I think from a state and from a governance perspective is the need for governments and states to diversify 
especially the continent. Yes, we've got good mineral resources, but if you do not know how to diversify in your offering, you're going to be literally be going to send these countries and our countries into into recessions time and time again because we just we just fail at being able to diversify and we fail at being able to implement policies. Number two, I think that the deliverables are going to be very significant. Don't be a leader just because you're good, you, you, you mm. talk the talk. Leaders of the future are leaders that have actually got action to back up what they say. Mm. Less talk, more work. And I think that a lot of time people are just, people are becoming more and more smarter and awake. And I'm going to say this, they're becoming more and more woke mm. as time goes on. And they're becoming more and more interconnected as time goes on. So very soon your political rhetoric is not going to work unless you've got evidence to back up what you've been saying. So don't say that you're going to eradicate poverty if by in year five you haven't done anything and implemented any policy. And please note, I didn't say conceptualize any policies because that's what we're good at from a governance perspective. We're so great at, at drafting policy. We're completely terrible at implementing the drafted policies. Mm. So it's about the drafted policies. How do you implement those policies? Show me what you're good for. Show me that you can actually lead a country. Show me that there's evidence of growth and development under your leadership. Mm. And if there's no growth and development under your leadership, then step aside so that somebody else can come in and do the work. So Faith, if you were to design a curriculum for future leaders, what are the skills and new skills that you would like to see and add to a leadership program? Sure. Um, I think that if I had to design a leadership program for leaders, it will be how to act local mm. and think global. Mm. I think that a lot of times our leaders are very narrow in their approach. And, and I'm, I'm going to say this without fear, no favor. We cannot in 2019 be talking about nationalized governments where nationalization and the nationalizing of our states, it becomes the top priority against a global community. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell me in 2019 where the world is formulating through the internet, through social media, where the world is becoming a closed and a smaller global community, you want to isolate ourselves and build walls and exclude people and have people look at each other from what nationality they are and refer to people as foreign nationals and, and, be, and excluding people. We cannot be having excluding or exclusive societies in 2019 that's a travesty that shows our inability to have vision and foresight and also shows our inability to be collaborative as leaders because a true leader is able to collaborate with another leader and see that other leader mm -hmm. as somebody who's going to be complementary to their work instead of somebody that's going to be competitive but if you're going to be stressing a nationalist agenda that says something about your fear of being able to cross borders mm -hmm. and the, the ability to learn from other organizations that's why certain organizations that are multicultural multidimensional um, multinational some of them are failing right now mm -hmm. because there's no support in it because people have taken on this nationalized framework okay this does not take away from the fact that actually um, you need to have your country strong so that you can be a strong contributor to other platforms mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not speaking mm -hmm. about that I'm speaking about how we're building walls and we're excluding people and we're separating women and children and we're calling this nationalized agenda it's not a nationalized agenda it's a narrow-minded agenda it's mm -hmm. an agenda that does not have sustainability and also it is one that 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 just goes against the very simple fabric of our society <coughs> we were not built to do that we were not mm. built to work as silos people have always been collaborative collaborating for decades and for millennia and for centuries on end who are we now to come in and say no we're going to take on a more closed in approach mm. to governance and leadership so that's the first thing how do you act local but think global mm. and i think that the second thing is also around entrepreneurial entrepreneurship and let me tell you why if you run a, a state like a business mm. and you care about it like it was your own business no businessman starts a business so that their purpose of the business is to fail mm. no entrepreneur goes into entrepreneurship so that their business can fail if we taught our leaders how to run a country like a, as if they were business mm. people then they would start evaluating the costs you would make damn sure that your um, your accountant has got the books right and it's not cooking the mm. books but has got the books right you would make sure that the various departments are operating efficiently because you understand what that contributes to your mm. to your general and your overall fiscal policy you would understand um, the fact that actually if your business does not make revenue for example your mm. GDP if your business does not make revenue then you're in big trouble you would understand that if your business is not able to pay its debtors and its loans you are in big trouble hence why we've got such an exorbitant trade deficit you would understand that 
actually when it comes to your state owned enterprises some of them some of them you need to call it what it is that some of them have failed and therefore they need stronger leadership and not be afraid to get rid of the dead weight because if you were an entrepreneur you would not let your business have dead weight if you were enterprising mm. so we need to start teaching leaders how to look at the country as entrepreneurs and as business people this is your baby it's that's why we've got so many business and so many um leaders looting their own countries because mm. how do you loot something that's yours how do you loot your own business mm. so if you started to look at at a country like your own business how do you steal from yourself mm. In essence, it would be stealing from yourself because you, as the business owner, would be stealing from yourself. Mm. You can't steal from yourself. So I think that's the, I think they definitely need to learn entrepreneurship skills, but also learn um, skills around effective communication. Mm. I think that a lot of times we get lost in translation. Not because we mean unwell, but simply because we don't necessarily know how to articulate ourselves very well. And therefore, it comes in with the political maturity and understanding different cultural nuances and understanding the fact that people and the global community is made up of a diverse people, mm. right? And be able to communicate effectively with such people. Um, and that, that becomes quite significant. But you cannot run a country if you don't have personal invested interest mm. in it. That's where we're failing in leadership, is that we're looking at a country as an opportunity, as a <coughs> bank, as a bank account. Mm. Too many leaders are looking at states as their mm. own personal piggy banks. Mm. It's not your piggy bank. It's an, entrepreneurship, mm. it's an entrepreneurial pursuit. It's your legacy. Mm. If you looked at a country as your legacy, you wouldn't want your legacy to turn into ashes because of your mm. um, indiscretions and because of your bad decision making. Mm. But we don't have many leaders that look at it as an entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial pursuit and as a legacy project. We have a lot of leaders looking at it as an ATM. Mm. So Faith, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored somebody and that person took your advice to heart? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that I've been, I'm fortunate enough to be given different platforms where I'm able to speak on leadership mm. and, and, and building. And sometimes I'm not able to personally interact with, with, with people. But I will mention one story. And I forgot her name. I think her name is Nomsa. But I will mention one story of a, of a young woman mm. that came to me um, when I had an event at the U.S. Embassy and she said to me, Faith, you may not remember me, but um, I was part of the audience that you were speaking to when you came to give a talk on leadership and development and mm. how, to, um, how to own your power as a woman. And she said to me, Faith, the day that you spoke, I made the decision to go to school and today I'm an advocate. And I thought, and I broke down into tears. Mm. I actually have the photo, I took photos with her. And I broke down, she's an advocate. And she said to me, you don't know what you contributed to me. For you, it was just a speech. For me, you literally changed my entire life. And I thought, my gosh, someone sat and listened to me speak and went to school. Mm. A young woman went to school. She then became an advocate and she gets to come back to me and mm. say, this is what you did. This is how you contributed. And for me, there's no greater glory than knowing the fact that you've changed the course of history for someone in someone's family. And I think that that for me is, is a big standpoint. That's when I knew that I was on the right track. And mm. also, I mean, I run a school, right? Mm. And the job and the role of the school is to upskill our young African women across color and across creeds mm. on skills that are fourth industrial revolution related so mm. m i'm taking young black women and young white women and young blue purple and asian mm. whatever it is all young african women i'm putting them in through this course and through this program where they get to understand issues around data analytics and they get to study um, programs on coding when i mean my girls just went to a coding course they just get to understand coding the way they understand the future of 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 employment and what the future of work looks like and I'd be able to align skills to that. So for me, it's I'm imparting skills <laughs> to this new generation of women who are literally going to be taking over the world, literally taking over mm. the world because they're upskilling. And for me to know that I'm contributing positively to someone's future mm. and current moment, there's no greater legacy than that. That's what drives me. That's what wakes me up in the morning. That's what gets me uncomfortable. That's what mm. gets me edgy because I'm every single day I'm given an opportunity to contribute to someone's life. How dare I take that mm. for granted? So Faith, are there any role models of leadership that you would suggest future leaders should study and maybe learn from? Ooh. Um, role models um, of future leadership. I think 
you know what? I'm gonna, and I'm gonna just gonna use my my experience. I don't think that learn from one person. Mm. I think learn from a plethora of people. Mm. See what different people are doing in their own diverse spaces. But let me tell you what an effective leader does. Mm. An effective leader doesn't say, "I'm a banker, therefore I shall analyze and look at only people in the banking sector," mm. because agility and because where the future of leadership is going is going to require you to have different forms of reference to actually draw from, um, especially when it comes to dealing with a diverse community. So what I'm saying is, understand what a leader is doing in a creative industry. And how they do it, mm. and apply it in your banking sector. Understand how a banker does it, and apply it in your sector. Understand how somebody in in linguistics does it, and apply it, or in marketing does it, and apply it in your sector. Mm. In governance, does it, and apply it in your sector. I think that there's an opportunity and there's a space for us to learn from each other across various dimensions, even people in the media space, and learn from people in the media space and see how they're applying um, their everyday journeys and, and mm. learn from that. I think that leaders who are able to draw inspiration from different pockets of society and from different levels are truly leaders that can be effective and also leaders that are sustainable. Um, I think that by being closed-minded and narrow-minded, we're only limiting ourselves as well as our capacity mm. and our ability to <coughs> To learn from other people and that's where we fall short we fall short when we start limiting our ability to learn from other people I learn from different people in life. I learn from different walks in life. I mm. learn from artists as much as I learn from media practitioners as mm. much as I learn from people in the um, you know in co uh, construction industry. I'm part now of the the BRICS business the BRICS business council skills mm. working group and the reason why I'm part of the BRICS business council skills working group I mean, I'm adding value, but you must never take it for granted. I'm there to learn because mm. there are various people in different sectors of industry that are doing amazing things in their lines of work. But I'm not going to sit back and assume that I know it all. I don't know it all. A true leader is someone that can actually acknowledge the fact that they don't know it all and they are willing mm. to learn from people that have actually gone through the path and some people that are in different sectors of industry. That's the only way we're going to be ahead of the curve. And that's the only way we're going to be um, sustainable um, mm. As, as leaders where, where your, your legacy does not fall short because of our limited capacity and our limited mindsets. It's only when we start learning from other people doing mm. different things that we can truly be effective in our own work. So Faith, how can our listeners um, follow you and where should they connect with you? Um, so they can connect with me on different platforms. So I'm going to give you my, my start with my email address. If you want to engage with me, interact with me, find out more, um, mm. it's faith at femtali, which is F m t a l i dot com femtali stands for the faith mangope technology and leadership mm. institute and um, find me on social media faith mangope on all platforms um, right. um, twitter instagram um, facebook faith mangope or faith in mangope um, and yeah I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm on social media um, and and I'm on email you can find me on LinkedIn mm. faith mangope as well and um, let's engage let's interact let's build one another and I think that there's just so much opportunity for us to be able to hone in on our various skills as well as our different experiences in this journey called life. I say let's journey together. Mm. And last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own life? Mm. I think <laughs> for any leader of the future, for any future leader, and this is coming from someone who aspires to be a future world-class leader. Mm. I'm still building that future world-class leadership brand. Um, I think the first thing is be authentic. Mm. People are not stupid. People never underestimate the wisdom and the ability of people to see through the facade. Mm. If you are truly authentic in your message, if you're truly authentic and live a life of, of authenticity, people are able to connect with you better. Mm. True leadership is found in the ability to connect with people. Because if you are a leader and you do not lead people, then who are you leading? Mm. But the only way people are going to want to follow you is when you are authentic, when they know that they're not following a fake. Mm. And I think that in a world where there's social media, which stresses the need to be perfect all the time, 
people need authenticity mm. people want to see someone who's operating in their truth and who's operating mm. in their pure authenticity that's why i'm so open about my past and about where i come from and about various challenges that i've been through because it makes me authentically faith mangope and i would not want mm. to be anybody else so if you know that if you're going to be following me you're following faith mangope in her truest form of authenticity and truth and i think that leaders need to operate from a place of authenticity because when you can be authentic when you are authentic you connect and when you connect that's where true change can actually come about well great thank you so much for sharing thank your you. insights and your wisdom into the future of leadership and reminding us of um, the need for may i say mining human human capital yeah That's the new mining. You need to mine human capital. That's the new that is the new mineral resource. Human capital. Thank you. Thank Madam you. President. <laughs> Thank you so much.